boldly engaging the mindless propaganda of our time. Apparently with reason, this is Rage of the Age. This is Rage of the Age, and we have with us today the Professor Emeritus of History at Millersville University of Pennsylvania. He has been researching and writing about Puritanism in the 17th century Atlantic world for over 50 years. He has published 19 books, including his most recent work, One Small Candle, The Plymouth Puritans and the Beginning of English New England, published in September by Oxford University Press. For the past three years, he has served as coordinator of New England Beginnings, a partnership of over 30 institutions and individuals dedicated to commemorating the cultures that shaped New England 400 years ago by promoting educational programs. I will introduce you today, Dr. Francis J. Bremer, or Frank Bremer. Frank, welcome to the show. Thank you. Very glad to be here. The Puritans over the past few years have become a fascination to me. And when I compare it to what I've used to know about them from typical education, came from England looking for religious freedom, uh, didn't know how to take care of themselves. The Indians saved them. They had Thanksgiving. There's this Mayflower compact thing about consent of the governed. That's about the extent of my knowledge of them for the longest time. Uh, uh, but the, they, the more I have learned about them and about the Puritanism that was in England, and uh, I see an amazing, <laughs> it, there's so much more to this story and the impact as it formed the United States than you know I probably ever figured out sometime before. Uh, this new book you have, The One Small Candle, it, is that what this is about, is the, the effect they had upon the nation that would be birthed over here? Well, implicitly it is. Um, it's, it's really trying to tell um, the story of the Plymouth colony from a religious history perspective. And I think that over the years, uh, that tended to get ignored. Uh, mm. You had people who wanted to focus on economic aspects or uh, political aspects and so forth. And the actual religious drive that impelled these people and, and dictated their lives uh, was often ignored. So I pick up the story uh, back in England, in uh, East Anglia, broadly conceived, around the village of Scrooby, where these people form their own congregation in opposition to the official church. Uh, they're forced by uh, persecution um, to emigrate. They settle first in the Netherlands and spend about 10 years in the town of Leiden uh, and then come to America in 1620. And so I follow that story and then talk a little bit about how they try to implement their religious ideas uh, here on this side of the Atlantic. Now, implicitly, uh, there are things that I talk about that I think are an important part of the legacy that, that shapes uh, the United States, or that contributes to shaping the United States. It's, it's not just one source that, that makes us who we are. It's interesting you mentioned the, from a religious perspective, because that was their perspective, because now it seems that this story is being fashioned with the view that the Puritans showed up with a, a Bible, a sword, desolation, and destruction in their hand, and just went loose. <laughs> That's the new story, as opposed to, <laughs> but that was not their goal at all. It was uh, to practice their religious beliefs yeah. and to come to a place where they could do it, absolutely. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, I, I was going to say, it, it's one of the things that's happening this year and, and probably in the next few years as we celebrate the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower and so forth, is there is more attention uh, being devoted to the Native population which, which had been previously decimated by the introduction of European diseases by fur traders, merchants, and so forth. Uh, and that's an important part of the story. I mean, for a long time, we neglected the indigenous people, uh, but it's not the only part of the story. And as I say, uh, I'm trying to focus on the colonists themselves and their religion. And to, emphasize, uh, to elaborate on that a little bit, I think there are, there are three major parts of the legacy that they give us, which I think are deeply related to their religion. First, uh, because they believed it was vitally important for every individual to be able to encounter the Word of God personally through the Bible, uh, they believed that everyone, men and women, 
uh, adults, children, servants, uh, free people should have to be able to read, should be able to read the Bible. And while we don't know as much about the schools that were established in very early Plymouth, uh, we do know that this was a very literate society, more literate than any uh, communities in England at the time. Uh, we have inventory from all the first generation settlers and they had multiple books. Uh, William Bradford, who was the elder of the congregation, uh, had a library when he died of over 400 books, which is extraordinary wow. for that time. Yes. So the, the emphasis on the importance of education and reading is, is one part of their legacy, and it goes right back to their religious belief in the need to read the Bible. Secondly, um, the Plymouth Puritans were Congregationalists, which meant that they first organized their congregation by ordinary people coming together, discussing matters, and then forming a covenant to create the church. And this is a form of, of participatory democracy. And while there are other strains that lead to the democratic institutions of our country, this is a very important one. Uh, they, the Mayflower Compact was an expression of that same desire that the people who were involved should determine how things are going to be done. So that idea, you find it in the Mayflower Compact, it spreads to uh, town meetings and other aspects of New England life. And again, that, that comes out of, in their case, their religious background. And, and finally, and this is really from my perspective, there's what I call their social gospel. Uh, what Pulitzer Prize winning author Marilyn Robinson recently described as a social ethic with strict expectations around charity, uh, sort of a tradition of, of Christian uh, liberalism, economic justice. And you know, we see this in the advice that Pastor John Robinson, who did not accompany them to America, gave the colonists. We find it in uh, a lay sermon uh, preached by Robert Cushman in 1621, in which he warned the colonists against what he called the bird of self-love and urged them to look out for one another. And, and in many ways, this was a reaction against a, a growing rampant individualism in the 17th century, something that Shakespeare was also critical of. Um, and again, th this comes from their reading of the Bible and the importance of loving their neighbor as themselves. So those are three different things which I think do eventually contribute to uh, our country and which uh, are rooted in the Plymouth religious beliefs. Wow, and that, that's quite a, a depth when you think about it, uh, especially in this time where it seems to be numerous historians want to say that there was no real, um, that the Christian, the American nation was never really a Christian nation. It was just, it was there, but we, we formed the, these ideas came from a secular vacuum or something. I don't know. Um, but I believe what you're saying that for people to be educated was not for education's sake. It was to know their scripture, and, and that was the driving motivation that led to these schools, and it eventually would lead to the birth of Sunday school <laughs> to mm -hmm. to instruct uh, those in, in time of no public education so that they could learn how to read uh, the scripture. The congregationalism is an interesting thing you bring up because that is, in essence, an exercise of democracy slash republicanism in the running of a church, something that in England, well, in most of, most of history, had not been done that way before. It used to, it, even in their time, it was top down, right? So this is a, to a totally new approach. And, and you're saying this came from their idea of scripture? Yeah, well, it, it's part of it, without getting too deeply into the weeds, comes from uh, right. how you define church when the term is, is used in the scripture. And yes. for them, they believe the church was the individual congregation, uh, the group of people in a particular place, not a broader national or international movement. And so it, it was a very localized understanding. Uh, they hoped that other people would do the same thing. But, you know, they, they 
it was um, it did emphasize a, a democratic impulse, not only in the formation of the church, but it was the congregation that chose its clergymen. And then even after the clergymen were picked, while they listened to the guidance of clergymen, it was the congregation, the actual members who would decide on changes in, in, in polity and so forth. And, and I should add one other thing that I think is, is important to, to note. Um, these are people who uh, emphasize the importance of searching for a further light. Uh, they, they didn't believe that they had all of the answers. Um, John Robinson, who I mentioned was the pastor of the pilgrims uh, in Leiden and who was behind the venture that he hoped to come over to America, but he was never able to. He talked about the fact that, you know, in, in looking at scripture and trying to understand what God wants, we, we are, as St. Paul put it, looking through a glass darkly. And, and we can't understand all of the details. And particularly, as he puts it, after so long uh, of living in error, uh, talking about the, the many generations of, of what he called anti-Christian, which we would recognize as the Catholic Church, um, it, it would be impossible to emerge from that and know everything. And, and he was critical of other Protestants. Wow. He said one of the problems with, with Calvinists is they think that Calvin gave them all the answers and they won't go any further. Uh, the same <laughs> with Lutherans. And so he said, you know, you, you have to be open to this. And parallel to this, uh, when John Winthrop led the great migration that settled Massachusetts in 1630, he preached a lay sermon of Christian charity, which has, among other things, uh, you know, the phrase that we shall be as a city upon a hill if we do what God wants. But there are other important parts of that sermon. And one of the things that I've always been struck with, he said that if we do our best in living up to God's expectations, he will reveal to us much more of his will and knowledge and so forth than we currently have. So again, there's that sense that, you know, you don't want to believe that you have the answers and the only answers and everyone's going to have to live exactly by you. You're open to further light, to discussions and so forth. And of course, with congregationalism, it's that discussion of further light that over the years leads people to move in different directions. So you have a fragmentation of original congregationalism, ultimately leading to uh, various reform congregations and ultimately producing Unitarianism. Uh, I mean, all of the early Unitarian churches were founded in the 1630s as Puritan congregations in Massachusetts. So, and this is something I've had to come to terms with over the past few years. Puritanism is not a particular spelled out philosophy, if you will, uh, theology even. It's, it, there's a, quite a, that encompasses quite a group of uh, thought in, in that spectrum can be at odds with each other, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, uh, there's a, an English historian, uh, Alexandra Walsham, who, in writing about uh, charitable hatred, she called the book, she was talking <laughs> about how, uh, how p every community sets, as she put it, a perimeter fence. And the perimeter fence is sort of the boundary between what's tolerable and what's beyond the pale. And that's negotiated by every group over time and so forth. And, and so if you look at early New England, there are differences that are either reconciled or, as one leader said, you know, left to continue to exist until we get more light. Uh, but then there are going to be positions that are advocated and discussed that go beyond the pale. Uh, that no one or the vast majority are not going to accept. And so they say, no, that's the thing. And, and so Roger Williams gets banished and Hutchinson gets banished. Uh, but if we focus on those instances, we fail to recognize the many occasions when there were differences that are either reconciled or that are uh, left to lay until further light is, is going to be found. So when you mentioned uh, Winthrop and the migration movement in the 1630s, 
that group would be considered primarily Puritans, right? Yes. Yeah, they're Puritans. Um, now, these are people who had not left the Church of England officially, right. uh, so they didn't have much experience in terms of uh, how they start to worship in the New World, because they mm -hmm. certainly weren't writing a letter to you know the Archbishop of Canterbury saying, can you create a parish for us in Boston? Right. So uh, actually, it was one of the Plymouth uh, Puritans, uh, Samuel Fuller, who was a lay deacon who traveled to Boston, uh, to Salem and Boston and Watertown and the various communities in 1629, 1630 in Massachusetts, and explained to them how the pilgrims had organized their churches, how they operated. And that basically um, becomes the New England way. They essentially adopt the Plymouth practice. And that's where the title of the book comes from. Uh, William Bradford, who was governor of Plymouth, at one point writes that, you know, from one small candle, meaning Plymouth, uh, mm -hmm. many others have been lit throughout the region. And so. So that's an interesting connection. So this, uh, uh, cause the, the colony of Plymouth had a rough start mm -hmm. and probably should have perished by all rights at numerous occasions, uh, yet survived and was looked to as a model of, Hey, how do we how do we get on over here and you know and and the connection you made here is a religious one which i never thought about before the the colonists at plymouth were separatists who left the church of england right so these other puritans who came over were still members of the church of england but apparently organizationally and geographically and all these other issues are now being uh met how do we do church <laughs> over here without the church of england here i guess is the problem Mm -hmm. And so Samuel yeah, well, goes up there and teaches them this stuff, right? Yeah, to, to actually get back to a point we were discussing a moment ago in terms of, of further light, you know, we, we tend to classify uh, the Plymouth colonists as separatists, and they are, but there's a big spectrum. And actually, mm -hmm. when they left England uh, in 1606, 1607, they were what we would call strict separatists in that they said that, you know, uh, we can't afford to be uh, affected by continuing to have any contact with people who don't leave the Church of England. And mm -hmm. so yes. they were uh, isolating themselves entirely. And some separatists, a different group of separatists in Amsterdam, continued to maintain that position. One, when they were in Leiden, the Plymouth people, uh, could not totally isolate themselves. And they had exchanges with professors in the University of Leiden. They had exchanges with uh, foreign religious leaders who were there. They had exchanges with some English Puritans who uh, stayed in Leiden for a while. And gradually, John Robinson and William Brewster and the others modified their views. They came to realize that there were godly people in the Church of England and even though they had not themselves separated, we can have contacts with them. We can meet with them. And that's an important shift to a sort of semi-separatism because right. without that shift, uh, Samuel Fuller would not have felt that he could go to talk mm -hmm. to the people in Massachusetts. And that whole dynamic would not have been able to occur. I don't know if we can fathom the, the setting and the mindset that they were in at the time. The, the whole religious understanding under the authoritarian Catholicism, were, and, and they've just recently, a lot of them just got the Bible in their own language. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, for the longest time, it was in Latin in the Western, uh, Western Europe, and they're reading it for themselves. The church that existed really only taught them the very basics and basically just do what we say, take these, take these elements, you know, practice these sacraments and do what the church tells you. And that was about the extent of their religion, but they're now trying to grasp and understand what the scripture is saying in a setting where that never happened before. So you're bound to have a lot of this working out process, tr trying to uh, go towards the light, I guess, as, as you're saying. Yeah. Well, and you know, and again, there, there's, there's this tremendous variety along a very broad spectrum. Uh, you mm -hmm. met very earlier, you know, England and, uh, for the most part, you know, if you look at England during the period of the 
civil wars, Puritan revolution, wars of religion, whatever you want to call it, um, you have some Puritans who move towards a more authoritarian way. I mean, Presbyterians uh, right. were concerned that giving the ordinary people too much liberty might lead to chaos. And so they emphasized uh, clerical supervision within the congregation and sort of synods uh, that would bring various churches together to make sure they were towing the same line. But on the other hand, you have Puritans who uh, went off in different directions. You have a vast expansion of the Baptist movement. You have uh, a lot of other sects which did not, that sort of dynamic did not occur as much in New England, although, as I mentioned, we had Roger Williams and Hutchinson, but it does in England. And, and really, if you go to the idea that the individual uh, can have that direct contact to, to God through the Bible, it's not much of a step, and which many people take, to say, mm -hmm. well, I, I don't really need God to inspire me in my reading of the Bible. God can inspire me directly. And, and there you're moving into Quakerism, right. where the, you have the inner light. So again, you're not trusting on external authorities. You're looking at your inner inspiration, which you believe comes directly from God. You're listening to Rage of the Age. Rage of the Age. Politics, religion, economics, and history with a conservative bend. But looking at that time, there was definitely a lot of directions that this idea took for you had some going like really to one side of the spectrum of being communistic in outlook. And then you have some being more libertarian outlook. You have mm -hmm. uh, the, some with a reaction of, you know, we have to tone this down some, but they were all Protestant in mind. You know, yep. wanting to find that greater light that had been suppressed by a centralized church, not concerned with knowledge of Scripture. Um, but let's let's look then at England itself. But the interesting connection to me is is the things that happened in that place in Great Britain around this time frame, the 1600s into the 1700s, had a great impact on who we were because the immigrants to the colonies came from there. A lot of them came yep. from there bringing those ideas. So let's look at the events that were taking place in that time. You mentioned the English Civil War. Mm -hmm. Now, it, my understanding is the main thing, one of the main things that kicked that off besides the arbitrary uh, revenue raising of the king was the issue of the Book of uh, Common Prayer and other religious uh, practices he was trying to institute in the church. Mm -hmm. um, wh why was that causing such a stir? Well, first of all, um, you know, the, the Puritans and it, the Pur Puritanism had been a, a, a growing movement during uh, the Elizabethan era, 1559, 1603. Um, and then when the Stuart monarchs come in following the death of Elizabeth, uh, James I in 1603, and then later his son Charles in 1625, during Elizabeth's age, it, it had been possible for Puritans who advocated some changes. They, they were essentially Calvinistic in their theology. Uh, the Elizabethan church was, was relatively consistent with that. They wanted to do away with certain religious ceremonies that they thought were the remnants of Catholicism, the requirement that clergy wear uh, special vestments. Uh, they wanted to do away, they wanted every community, every parish to have a preaching clergyman, not just mm -hmm. someone who read out homilies prepared in London. Um, and in many respects, particularly in a local area, uh, Puritans were able to worship pretty much as they wanted uh, during that period because local authorities weren't that interested in swapping them down. And, and they were right. largely a middle class with some upper class element. With the Stuarts, you begin to get more of a pressure for conformity, uh, and you also begin to get the effort to reinstate some practices that had been associated with Roman Catholicism. So not only do you have to wear vestments, uh, but one of the critical things was 
Puritans advocated or among Protestants who advocated uh, taking what had been the Roman Catholic altar at an elevated position in one part of the church and bringing it down into the mid middle of the congregation as a communion table. Mm -hmm. uh, Archbishop Laud, appointed by Charles I, requires that it be restored and it be railed in to sort of separate uh, the sacrament from the, the people in the congregation. So you have pressures that way that are, are building up within the community. What triggers it is that Charles I, um, who was Scottish originally, I mean, the, the Stuarts come from Scotland, right. decided to try to impose the English patterns, the English prayer book and such on Scotland. And the Scots were Protestant Presbyterian. They had their own uh, moderate, modified system. And that triggers a rebellion in the late 1630s. Uh, the Scots rise up to protect their own religious point of view. The king, in order to try and suppress it, calls Parliament. Parliament had not met for over a dozen years. And the calling of Parliament, first the short Parliament, then the long Parliament, gives all of the people who were dissatisfied about the English religious development a chance mm -hmm. to demand things. And ultimately, the demands on the king become such that the king, in essence, declares them in rebellion against him. Uh, and you have the spread of war from Scotland in, into England and, and the whole uh, civil wars with Parliament eventually winning, uh, executing Charles I and creating a Puritan commonwealth and then protectorate under Oliver Cromwell. So it, it, they're, they're, they're obviously in history, there, there's, we don't believe in any monocausal uh, explanations. I mean, there's not just one thing that does it, but religion right. there is a very important driver of what happens and what parliament is trying to do uh, and what it ultimately will try to do during the course of the 40s and 50s. Was there a, a huge tie with political thought merging with uh, English ideas of liberty from Magna Carta onward that were just coming to a head with an authoritarian king? Yeah, there are. Um, and there's some, there's some work that's been done by uh, some historians that, that are also looking at you know, what are basically the, the libertarian impulses within uh, Protestantism and within Puritanism. And, and we talked a little bit about that in terms of participatory democracy, you know, and, right. you, you know, you get to a point where you say, well, you know, why should the king simply decide what we're going to think? Uh, we have a right to do this. And, and you know, how you connect that right uh, to Magna Carta, to various other traditions uh, becomes part of the story. Right. It's, it's interesting to me to look at it, um, that parliament that technically is only has a right to exist by consent of the king at that time, decides to go to war with the king um, over, well, this issue and other issues. That was quite a, that had to have been quite a break in, in the mentality of a lot of their own countrymen. Well, I mean, you, a lot of people, the, the, King had the right to call Parliament and the right to dissolve Parliament. Now, right. most people in general thought that the proper thing was for the king to regularly consult his subjects through Parliament and to, and to work things out. When you had a period of about a decade without Parliament, there was a lot of agitation that, that, that this was not part of the English tradition. Now, mm -hmm. When Parliament, when Charles first calls a Parliament, they say, well, you know, you need money to prosecute the war against Scotland. Uh, we'll give it to you if you meet these conditions. Right. And, you know, he says, no, go home and dissolves Parliament. Uh, and then he finds a few months later he can't run the war. So he calls Parliament in session again. And this becomes known as the Long Parliament. And right. to your point, the, the first thing that Parliament does is to force the king to agree that he will not dissolve parliament on his own. And so they, you know, the king has technically the right, but he has ceded that right. And, and you know, that particular parliament will go for, for many, many years before there's a new election. Yes, the, the long parliament, the, the name is, is apt because it would <laughs> last for a very long time. Yes. Um, 
even to the point where it's like they didn't even want to dissolve themselves either, no matter what, <laughs> right. yes. which is contrary again to the English idea of how things are supposed to be done. Yeah. Uh, it's like they went the other direction to the extreme, it seems. Mm -hmm. And then they had a rump parliament, right? Where a section of it was left to run the country or something. How did that play? in? Yeah. Well, after uh, the King's army has been, had been defeated, uh, and one of the difficulties, one of the difficulties that Parliament had was how how do you get the settlement that you want? Because mm. basically, you need the king to agree, and th there's only a certain amount of leverage you can put on the king. You know, uh, you you might defeat him on the field of battle a dozen times, but he is still the king. Eddie still the king. All yes. right. So gradually, you're getting a a, a more a uh, hardline element in the parliament that is going to say, well, we're, we might have to bring the king to justice. He has waged war against his own people. We might have to do this. It's not a, uh, a universal view through parliament. And so members of the army uh, will go to the parliament house at one point and basically exclude certain people who are of the more moderate or even royalist tendency mm -hmm. uh, and what they're basically kicked out of parliament and what is left uh which is a more hardcore element is is often referred to as the rump uh because that's all that was left uh mm -hmm. and then they proceed to bring charles the first to trial to sentence him execute him um but then eventually uh the army increasingly is playing a, a political role and under its leader, Oliver Cromwell. And there right. will come a time when, when Cromwell, because the rump is not doing anything and because it's not uh, willing to call new elections, he will dissolve that parliament and, and call elections himself. Right. <laughs> it's uh, the, the army you mentioned is interesting too, because you, you had men like Cromwell rise to prominence and, and other um, prominent Puritans would rise up, Irritan, all these. And, and the army, at least under by the time of the new model, at least, mm -hmm. became in essence a Puritan army, right? Um, largely, and, and with, um, again, recognizing that within that definition of Puritanism, you have a lot of, of spectrum right. differences. Uh, yeah, one of the things I find fascinating is is the fact that um in the encampments of the army you you frequently have people who are uh basically discussing religious matters uh right. they're, they're, they're debating these things and then as the army tries to shape its position you have some large formal uh what are often referred to as the army debates in which delegates chosen from among the ranks meet mm -hmm. with Cromwell and Ireton and various others in order to discuss uh, what should be done in the country, but also what religious changes are necessary and so forth. So it is, um, you know, uh, it, it's a fascinating, you know, aspect of this that, you know, ordinary people, again, are motivated enough that they're, you know, carrying their little hip pocket soldiers' Bibles and they're looking at things and they're debating mm -hmm. one another about you know, which, which way does God want us to move and so forth. So for a lot of them, they're not just fighting just because they have a beef with the king. They're, they're wanting to actually move society to like another step or something, right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of them. And, and of course, this is, you know, one of the things that comes out of this and out of the army debates and such is what's often referred to as the leveler movement, because, mm -hmm. you know, most of the Puritan leaders in the parliament and the, the command structure in the army uh, are people who are relatively conservative on social and economic matters. And, and then suddenly you begin to get uh, this this push for you know equal rights and and so forth and and um it creates a rift of sorts ultimately uh the more radical leveler digger uh attitudes that come out of the army are, are suppressed controlled might be a better word uh so right. they don't produce much um but still it, it's 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 a fascinating dynamic uh, with ordinary people really engaging in these types of discussions. 
it, it's it's fascinating to me because I, I've I served twenty years in the army, and when I compare that army to the one I was in, it's like night and day difference on so many levels. You know, you, <laughs> it, the, the to, to try to impose no drunkenness on the current army, you, you can, but the soldiers are not just going to renounce drinking. It's just it's just a part of its organization. When you have, uh, you know. Being involved in politics is, you know, kind of, it's even discouraged in our army, though you, it pops up once in a while. The tendency is, is stay, that's not in your lane. You stay out of it yeah, and let them deal with it. And you just do what you got to do. And uh, I mean, you, we would have these great debates and discussions, but by no means were we forming committees to, well, let's go to Washington and start sorting out senators and make <laughs> this come to pass. Well, it's, it's a totally different mentality. It, it is. And, and it's, you know, and it's one of those things that, that in itself is, is probably worth uh, looking at that, you know, do you want, uh, you know, the army to interfere in the right. shaping of civil society? You know, and, and when, when we created our own country with the revolution and the, the Constitution, you know, we made it very clear that we did not want uh, the military in, involved in uh, political affairs. We wanted to keep it under civilian control. And Oliver Cromwell is a very important figure in this regard because, you know, historically in America, in the, the early parts of our nation, uh, people who thought about Cromwell had mixed views because in, in right. many ways, you know, he's considered a, a leader uh, or a defender of parliament but on the other hand, he's a military leader who basically used <laughs> power to take control. And there, there's, I don't know if you've ever been to London and visited the Houses of Parliament, but right outside the Houses of Parliament, there's a statue of Oliver Cromwell. And that was erected in the 19th century. And it, in they, it engendered tremendous dispute because wow. <laughs> the, the Parliament was not going to pay for it. So it was paid for by private subscription. Yeah. Uh, and the original idea was that that statue should be in the Houses of Parliament, like we have statues in Statuary Hall in, in the Capitol. Uh, and, and Parliament would have nothing to do with that because he was a man who did dissolve Parliament uh, <laughs> at one point, you know, and, and chased the remaining members out of the House. So it, it, it's a very ambiguous uh, reputation that he has in many ways. Absolutely. I, uh, you know, this is, this is the same Oliver Cromwell who had his bones dug up at the restoration oh. <laughs> to, to dishonor, to just like try to erase his memory or prestige or something. Um, well, there were, about, was, there were about a dozen of his supporters, uh, who for, unfortunately for them were still alive, who were hung, drawn and quartered in their heads, right. the walls of London, uh, for have, for their role in all of this. And mm -hmm. you're right. Mm -hmm. They, 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 they couldn't, get Cromwell because he was dead. So they dug up his body and uh, mistreated it. Right. That's <laughs> Cromwell definitely is. Um, he's one of them guys you, you can either love or hate. He's not an in-between man. He's a man of uh, fury and uh, determination to the full. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I often, um, as, as we get involved in debates nowadays about, you know, historical reputations and, Mm -hmm. statues of various people and everything. I've, I've spoken on this a number of times, and I often start off by talking about how when, when Oliver Cromwell uh, was in power and he was having his portrait, official portrait painted by an artist by the name of Peter Whaley, yes. um, he told the artist uh, to paint it accurately, warts and all. Warts and all, yes. And, and you know, and I, often, and I try to tell audience, I say, you know, this is the way that historians have to look at the past. It, it, there are warts. We yes. have to acknowledge the warts, but it's not appropriate to only focus on the warts, to mm. only focus on the negative aspects of someone. You, you have to paint the complete picture, warts and all. Yes, because he, he's a guy that I, I, I admire like as a, a military leader and as mm. wanting an efficiency in the Army. His his religious uh, fervency, I admire. Um, his determination to see things through is admirable. Uh, but then, right when he gets power, 
and it just that's it's like whoa where did you go with that uh that's where i'm like yeah i don't really you know agree with that direction you took there yep uh though i'm sure he felt he had to make the move because what do you do with a rump parliament that just sits there you know right yeah so all these puritans coming from and and again wide spectrum all those puritans coming from england at this time they're moving towards new england Mm -hmm. um so they're bringing a lot of these ideas with them that are going to be a part in shaping the United States, right? Yeah, uh, but it also then begins to go the other way. I mean, during mm. the English Civil Wars, there are large numbers of New Englanders who uh, go back to England because they mm. see the opportunity of trying to reshape England along uh, a New England dimension. Uh, so like John Winthrop, one of his sons serves as a colonel in the parliamentary army under uh, Oliver Cromwell. Edward Winslow, who was one of the early governors of Plymouth, uh, becomes uh, an agent of, of the parliamentary and then protectorate government. Lots of clergy and new Harvard graduates go back to take up positions in the English church. And, and then there are ideas. One of the things that New Englanders developed uh, was the idea that just as we should be able to or individuals understand God by reading the Bible, we shouldn't rely upon justices to tell us what the law is. We should have mm -hmm. the law written down. And so in New England, you have a published code of laws, which spells everything out for ordinary individuals to, to read. Whereas in England, wow. you have statutory, uh, some statutory law, but basically you have a common law tradition in which the law is defined by uh, decisions, and ultimately you have to have strong legal knowledge and be a lawyer in order to interpret the law. And so one of the things that is debated and not done in the parliament in the 1650s is to create a, a specific law code in England uh, on the New England model, uh, but that doesn't work. But there are other ways in which New England ideas uh, do continue to filter back to England, uh, mm. so that it's there's a real dynamic relationship back and forth. Absolutely, yeah, I can see that uh, we have an effect from them, and we have an effect back upon them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did not know there was no real written laws in England that far in. That that blows my mind. They they have statutes, but the the they're they're generally. Um, I wouldn't say vague, uh, they're mm -hmm. parliamentary statutes. They don't cover a lot of ordinary things. And no. so, you know, you have, and I mean, we have some of the same thing today too. I mean, you, you have uh, judicial opinions uh, that set precedents and then mm -hmm. get overturned. So the law is, is, is very dynamic, but that was much more the case uh, in England at the time. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's something that makes England a little bit different than us. Um, you know, they, there's no written constitution in England. Right, right. Uh, and it's and just, that baffles me too. <laughs> yeah, it's just a creation of, you know, precedents and uh, traditions and, and right. everything else. Uh, so it's a lot, a lot more fluid. Yes. That, that's scary to me. But <laughs> I guess that's why we wrote one down after the fact, right? <laughs> That one small candle, the Plymouth Puritans and the beginning of English New England, where can we find that? Uh, you can find it on Amazon. You can order it directly from Oxford University Press. And I would, in normal time, say, and you can pick it up in your local bookstore, yeah. but most of us aren't going out and many of the local bookstores aren't open anymore. Very true. Very true. <laughs> uh, Frank, I appreciate having you with us today. It's been an honor and a privilege speaking with you. Glad to be here. Thanks a lot. You're listening to Rage of the Age. Rage of the Age. Politics, religion, economics, and history with a conservative bend. For this essay segment, I want to broach a dangerous topic. Now, what dangerous topic would that be, maybe, you would think? I want to broach the dangerous topic of the role of religious fervency in the history of the United States. I'm pretty certain that that statement right there, for certain people, 
would make you hit the stop button and not even listen to the rest of what has to be said because there's just determination to remove all aspect of religious life from the formation of this nation and its continued effect on the nation even up to this very time. But I do want to broach that subject. The role of religious fervency in the history of this nation and even starts before where we think. It just goes before 1776. This has been taking place even before the pilgrims landed on our shores. Because it comes down to the notion, who shall I obey, man or God? Who shall I obey, the king who is appointed over me, or God who appoints the kings? Now, of course, to the kings, their answer is you obey me. Of course, any government of any power, any earthly authority, will always demand you obey me before you obey God. That began to change quite a bit, though, in England, before the New World was even settled. Well, you had the Reformation taking place in Europe, and it spread to England, and the English Bible, and the Bible was now getting into the hands of people in their own language to actually read it for themselves, that caused quite a stir. It created these small communities, small insignificant communities even, if you will. By comparison to the Church of England, these are small groups, insignificant, very limited in power. Anything they attempt is going to be clamped down on. Uh, Many of uh, there's a good number who are going to be burned at the stake for their faith. There's many who are going to be exiled or have to flee the country. They're, they're going to lose their property. They're going to be harassed or going to be thrown in jail. But it didn't stop them from pursuing their faith in God. They continued in it nonetheless. It was this persistency which drove many of them to Holland to a foreign nation just to worship God freely as they saw fit in accordance with the scriptures. I mean, what does it take to get someone to uproot from something that they have, where they could have basically got along well enough with what they had, but decided to become a criminal and move on and try another country in hopes of pursuing something else? Well, for these people, it was their faith. It was their faith in God to try to live out that faith according to how it was spelled out in the Holy Bible. And that's what drove them. To actually sacrifice and give up things to do that, that religious fervency is what got them to move. It was that religious fervency and to preserve what they had, which brought them to the new world, where they eventually landed at Plymouth Rock. It was that continuous desire to seek to live God accordance to how it is written out in the Scripture that drove many to leave Great Britain and come over to Massachusetts and other colonies to find a new life. This religious fervency took root in the colonies. And as we talked about in the interview today, where these ideas of you know, self-government began to really play out and have an actual practical application beyond the theory. And this idea that of conscience begins to, to form where you don't have this top-down entity forcing down on you to things, especially when it comes to the matters of God. And of course, this pans in different directions like we talked about today. But that idea that that seed is now planted and it begins to grow. But see, that religious fervency didn't just leave England to come here. It also stayed there and continued its, uh, well, how can I put it in the minds of many historians? It's agitation, if you will. This religious fervency continued its agitation. One of the greatest uh, examples of that agitation is seen in the English Civil War. 
Now, of course, that that title is kind of misleading because there wasn't one like we would think of in the Americas or the United States, uh, the American Civil War, where there was just that one war. And and that civil war was more geographical in nature than perhaps um, the one in England was. But there was multiple single civil wars in England. Uh, there was always fighting over who gets to be the king. But in th- this particular civil war is different because you had ent- entities of government against itself. You had parliament against the king, which was a- an unthinkable thing until the time. And one of the things that drove that conflict was religious fervency. I'm convinced in my own opinion, that without that religious fervency, that civil war may not have happened. There might have been a conflict, uh, maybe a replacement of the king, uh, you know, maybe concessions gained here and there over a certain time, but uh, an, an actual group fighting the king, I don't, I don't know if that would have been the case. I mean, maybe a different contender for the king, uh, for the for the throne, could have been advocated. That was a common. Uh, method to get what you want, but the idea that the those who are governed and the into, and the institutions that provide the consent for those governed could turn against the head of state and and actually take that head of state out, and they're a king, which on his side believes he's established by God. You can't remove him. Well, he was removed. His head was cut off. Right. That was started a good bit by religious fervency. Now, depending on how you want to view that history, depends on how you view that as a good thing or a bad thing, right? Because for many, you see, you know, democracy is being advocated against a monarchy. The monarch can't just do what they want. There, there's a lot of good things that come out of that conflict as far as how we view our concepts of government and democracy. But at the same time, you could look at it and, you know, if you despise the religious aspect of it, you could be against everything they did simply on that principle alone. And you would gladly give up the democracy if it meant having, um, if it meant having the religious aspect to it, that fervency involved with it. And, And that's, that's, I guess, the tension, if you will, in that ordeal. How much of it do you want to take from one side or the other when it can seem so difficult for, you know, many to swallow any of it uh, in our own day and age? But it was that religious fervency that drove it to that point to demand the king answer to the law, to demand uh, one of the things that are not brought up much because the focus is a lot on the religion as well, but the economic activities were being curtailed because of the monopolies of the king. He's looking to raise money any way he wants for his own government to do what he wants with it and to bypass everything that's meant to put that into some kind of control. You know, the use of bureaucracies to avoid law, kind of like what we see on a greater scale in our own nation today. And he was stifling economic activity by doing that. That was a drive in itself. You know, money buys out money problems. But when you have a religious fervency behind it to call it unfair and an assault upon liberties, and when you point out that the things you are dictating in the church is, you know, we're not going to tolerate it. When you have all these different aspects being tied in, you know, he's trying to push in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, seemingly behind people's backs, sometimes openly, it seems. Uh, you know, it made a lot of Protestants nervous, but he ignored it. He didn't care. And that was basically his whole thing. I don't care. I'm the king. I can do what I want. Well, there had to be an answer at some point. You know what answered him? Religious fervency. Otherwise, the history of England and even the United States could have been absolutely different It was if it was for not for that religious fervency that drove them. Now, when you look into the United States, of course, there was certainly a religious fervency that drove this nation for many years. I recall Charles Finney, who was a great revivalist back in his day in the 1800s, 
He studied law. His original profession was to be a lawyer. And he realized in the studying of all the legal textbooks and documents of his day, and, and this is in the early 1800s, so it's, uh, it's within a few decades of the Revolution and the formation of the early part of our nation, and he realized that the overwhelmingly our laws were based upon Scripture. The scripture, the laws that ex, that were on the books, they all the, all the ideas of from the Constitution to the state constitutions to the different ordinances and the towns and everything, it was all based upon God's holy word. There was a holy fervency in the formation of this nation that took root. It was that holy fervency, that religious fervency, that drove the abolitionist movement of which Finney was a part of it. Men like him were adamant about the slave trade. And that's another one of those things where I'm convinced that if there was not that religious fervency, there might not have been an abolitionist movement to oppose it. What drove it? That sense of morality, that sense of being right before God. That's what drove it and made that move. That's what brought us to our civil war, religious fervency. To put an end to a practice that should not exist. I'm convinced that the civil rights movement had a very huge element of religious fervency tied to it. To where you don't treat one group of people as if they are less than human compared to everybody else. That is not in keeping to our concepts of being made in the image of God. It was a religious fervency which pushed many to fight that fight when it needed to be fought. But now here we are in our own day and age, and we have things that need to be fought in our own time frame. And like I said, let me broach another difficult subject since we're on this topic of religious fervency. And I want to specify the horrendous practice of abortion which, plain and simple, is the slaughter of the unborn. If it was not for a religious fervency that exists in so many people to put that practice to an end, no one would care. And why would no one care? Because it's convenient. There's money being made. It's the same with any institution that is just becomes just apprehensive. There's money, and there's convenience, there's leverage, there's power involved. All those things are tied to it. But the one thing not being considered is the morality of the issue. The only people who care about the morality of any issue are those with a religious sense to them. Anyone who has a God-fearing love for God is going to look at that and say it must end. That a religious fervency is going to be applied and fought until it is made illegal. Just as much as it was done to stop the slave trade. Just as much as it was done to fight a totalitarian king. Just as much as it was done to extend civil rights to all people. Now we have our own fight in our own day and age. And I can imagine the the excuses and the arguments against the religious aspect in this argument, maybe they could be the same used before, right? Or well, it's, it's political, you know, the church shouldn't be involved, religious people shouldn't be involved. Well, one, again, I'm not a second-class citizen, so I'm going to be involved. But mainly, would you say that to those who wanted to end the slave trade? Oh, that's a political matter? Don't bring your church into this? That's the same argument. Right? Don't go against your king. They can be as uh, heavy-fisted as they want. Don't bring your church into this. Don't, extend, don't, don't talk about civil rights. This is a secular matter. Don't you bring your religion here on this. No, my friends, I think nowadays we need a religious fervency once again to deal with something absolutely evil. The idea that when my child is inconvenient, I can get rid of them and kill them. It is the fight of our age. And for those who have 
in their mind what the scripture says to them, who should I obey, man or God? And to you, the answer is God. Then let me remind you that with that religious fervency, this is the fight of our age, that we will not condone the murdering of our children anymore and we need to mobilize that fervency and make something happen. Maybe we look small now, but I tell you that movement's growing. It's been growing, and we need to keep pressing the issue right into the conscience of those of our brothers and sisters in our nation. This is simply wrong, and we need to push forward with it until it is done. You've been listening to Rage of the Age. If you love today's podcast, make sure to leave a review on the media you're listening through. Secure future episodes by heading over to rageoftheage.com and clicking the RSS feed button. Until next time, this has been Rage of the Age.